Hi, today I'm going to tell you about the sequel to the sci-fi thriller series based on Arthur Clarke's novel of the same name, called Childhood's End. The link to the first part will be in the description. The year 2035. The Golden Age has indeed arrived for mankind. Inequality, crime and wars are gone. People have renewable green energy and enough food for the entire planet. People are aging slower and there is virtually no sickness. The birth rate is rising. For those who cling to the old, there is New Athens, where the overlords have allowed everything to be left as it was. But Milo, for some reason, is worried about the future. He works at the Rupert Bayus Institute in South Africa, but even their scientific research is going nowhere. Milo's program gets shut down and he prepares to leave. His co-worker Rachel regrets it. He has spent his life studying the overlords, where they came from, what their language is like. But people have never learned anything. Greta, who has grown up, also thinks about the devil all the time. Carolyn visits Ricky and inquires about his well-being. The man has begun to get tired, and there is no way they can have a baby. But, as it turns out, the alien has appeared to announce that Earth now has a new destiny. A new room has mysteriously appeared in the center of boys, with a new job board. It is a communication device. But with whom? Jake's son sleeps very restlessly at night, and his wife talks in her sleep about saving the children. The man worries about his loved ones and takes Tommy to a psychologist Greta Jones. Boyce shows Milo a room full of animal figurines, which he captures and sends to the planet of the overlords. But one other species is missing from their collection, humans. And Boyce intends to persuade the aliens to take him with them. Tommy confesses to Greta that he travels to a dark and hot place at night. He sees fire on the ground and smoke in the air, and above it all is a huge eye. Greta tries to convince him that what is happening is unreal, but Tom suddenly grabs his head and starts screaming. There is nothing the adults can do, and Greta feels a gasp and her cross changes shape and comes off her neck. There is silence, and Tom tells the mother that all is well. The baby is no longer crying. The woman is dumbfounded. She is not pregnant. Ricky tries to confess to Ali, but suddenly collapses from severe pain in his body. The doctor makes a terrible diagnosis. This is what Carolyn was talking about. He is poisoned by some substance in the ship's hull. Greta goes to see the pastor. Although the churches have been long deserted, he keeps order and cleanness in his church. The woman talks about Tom and shows her cross. Milo says that the aliens look like demons because they have been to Earth before and people have seen them. Greta shows an illustration of hell. Tom describes the place of visitation exactly like that, and the overlords are the fiends of hell, attacking Faith, the last abode of humanity. Four months later, the Gregsons learn that they are having a daughter. Emmy comes up with a name for the girl, while Tom tells her father her sister's name, Jennifer. The astonished father hears confirmation from his wife, but she just picked that name, and Tom couldn't have known it. In the evening, Jake suggests that his wife flies to New Athens. After all, there was a lot of good things in the past life, art, culture, and hot dogs. Dr. Boyce demands that the Gregson family be brought in. Greta sees a report about Ricky's illness and goes to his farm. Jake receives a personal invitation from Boyce to negotiate the construction of a golf course, and after persuading his wife, agrees to the trip. Greta meets Sally. Boyce's reception begins. A large hall is packed with dressed up people. Rachel draws attention to a symbol in the window signifying love. She had such a pendant as a child. Boyce meets the Gregson family. Jake meets Milo, and he informs them that the center is closing. Then why was the planner really invited? He tells his wife and goes to find his son. But at that moment, the Earth supervisor enters the room. Carolyn reminds them the problems are gone and people have lost the need for research. But they have something to be proud of. Boyce tells them that the animals are being sent to Carolyn's planet for a zoo demonstration, and he thanks all the workers. Carolyn asks to bring Amy to a room with an Uja board for a talk. Tom recognizes the room, he has been in there when he was dreaming. The alien asks Emmy to put her hand on the disc. Carolyn can now talk to the one inside her. Carolyn is urged to accept what cannot be changed and to open up to it. A strong beam of light bursts out of the building and hits the sky. Tom refuses to go with his father and runs outside. Jake sees his son climb the high platform and jump down. Emmy faints. Carolyn is pleased. She has accepted and understood. And now we can move on. Jake sees Tom hovering half a meter off the ground. 
He comes to. It's old Jennifer. She's so strong. Milo realizes that what they saw was an alphabet. Each symbol is a letter associated with a particular constellation. He writes down the symbols and the letters. And he realizes. He has found the home of the overlords. Rachel kisses him. The alien brings Ricky the cure. Then he apologizes to Ellie. But Greta enters and accuses the alien of lying. Carolyn confesses. They are barren because of him. Ellie grabs the gun, but Ricky pursues her to put it down. The supervisor says that the day is coming when those who have children will have a harder time. He shields his friend from the pain of being a parent. Greta shoots the alien. He falls. Ricky injects him with a drug obtained for himself. Carolyn comes to his senses. Whether he lives or dies, it makes no difference. People have been fooling themselves. Back at home, Greta looks at a picture of her mother and suddenly hears her voice. Turning around, she sees a woman and walks toward her and goes out the window. Amy gives birth to a baby girl. Four years pass. Jennifer is playing in her room. Milo reflects on the children of a new age. They live in incomparably better conditions, eat healthy foods and are stress-free. People are evolving, but into what? He studies children with new abilities. One day, a boy is brought to him who moves objects easily. Ricky is getting worse and worse. He is only surviving on alien medication. Carolyn reports that the final stage has begun. They are not the authors of this plot. The alien himself has 24 children, so he understands the horror awaiting humans. Rachel sees a little girl with her arm outstretched upward and calling out for Jennifer. The same thing is happening all over the world. Jason notices children standing outside his house. Milo shares the children's abilities with Rachel. More importantly, they are all connected to Jennifer Gregson. Tom tells her that his little sister takes him to different worlds, even to places where no overlords have ever been. Jake tries to kick the kids out of his yard, but walking out the door, he stops in front of a huge number of them. The girl comforts her mother. She need not be afraid. The Gregson family leaves. The children block the way, but Jennifer orders them to Disperse. The family arrives in New Athens, but even there, the oncoming children keep their eyes on Jennifer. They are greeted by the mayor of the city, Jerry Halcrasa, and told that the aliens respect their decision to not live in their perfect world. There is a culture here. They even make movies. Jennifer suddenly says a cryptic phrase about red numbers that will end everything. Jerry brings the family to his studio. He was an artist before visiting of Carolan, and he tells of a daughter who died and was treated with earthly medicine. Amy believes that Jennifer will be surrounded by real, human life. But what if they are wrong? Jerry laughs. Then everyone will burn in blue flames. Ellie makes a collage of photos before the advent. She and Ricky had a pretty good life. Amy lets Milo talk to Jennifer. He is convinced that the girl is the conductor of power to which everything in their world is drawn and asks to look in the mirror. She shows him a picture of a fiery mountain. The mirror shatters. The end has begun. Milo is convinced. To prevent the end of Earth, he needs to get to the planet of the overlords. He asks Rachel to send him along with the animals. Jason invites the family to the movies. Rachel asks Milo not to fly away, but he has it all figured out. It takes 40 days to fly there, and they will definitely send him back. So in 100 days, he will be on Earth. The girl recalculates. At space speed, that's 80 years. Ricky is getting worse. He is in pain and calls out for Annabelle. Ellie responds to her name. Rachel and Milo are testing animal transport bags. The man shows the medications he takes with him. Adrenaline, steroids and vitamins. Then Rachel packs Milo in a squid bag. They say goodbye and he asks her that if he doesn't return in 80 days to go to the orbital station and lie in anabiosis. And he gives her a love pendant. The ship takes off. Ricky ends in a hotel room with Annabelle, but the girl disappears. He realizes that it is all just an obsession. Carolyn can bring her back and slow down time here. This is his gift to his friend. But Ricky picks up a picture of him with Ellie. This is reality, and asks him to destroy the room. At night, Ricky goes out into the yard and falls on the grass. He confesses his love to Ellie, and she lies down next to him. They look at the constellations. Then Ricky dies. The Gregson family is watching an old movie, but suddenly, Carolyn appears on the screen and proclaims that the Golden Age is coming to an end. The Great Intelligence has given them a task to oversee the transition of humanity to a higher level of mind. 
no more children will be born on Earth. The adults are left to live out their century in peace, paving the way for a new species. Jennifer takes to the sky, and all the children around the world rush after her. The inconsolable parents cry out in the pain of separation. Emmy and Jason hold Tom down and ask him to stay. And Jerry turns on the bomb. The red numbers start counting down. The Gregsons find him in the church. The man realizes they were greedy and violent, but they also composed music and painted pictures. Jake urges everybody to stay strong and get the children back. But the mayor reminds, there was only one hope. The children. There isn't any more. Tommy says goodbye as his parents die. Jennifer has given time to say goodbye. Now it's time for him to go. Emmy recalls how she and Jake met when they were children. They know what love and family are all about. There is an explosion. The girl is standing on top of a mountain. Energy swirls gathering around her and taking off into the sky. Milo comes to and sees an overlord who shows him his world. Forty years have passed on Earth, and everything that has happened was planned long ago. By nature, by the cosmos, by the supermind. He is the one who sends the supervisors who change worlds. Milo sees a pillar of fire, a connection to the supermind. And then he hears voices. This is the united consciousness. Children are God, and parents must let them go. This is the evolution into one mind. A lot of Rachels appear in front of Milo, and he comes to his senses. He has to come back. He wakes up in front of a screen with his home planet on it. 85 years have passed. The space station is long dead. He's shown Rachel's frozen body. Milo tears up the locket and Rachel is shattered into a thousand pieces. He realizes that he is the last living person on Earth. It's all over. Carolyn confirms that this is the fate of many worlds. They too have reached the height of their development. Humanity has so many flaws, but their children will go where overlords have no access. Milo asks to be sent to Earth. Someone has to be the last witness. And so, Milo sits in the middle of a ruined city on an old couch. He asks the supervisors not to forget about his planet. Jennifer, standing on the mountain, pulls energy from everywhere. Milo asks Carolyn to save at least something from Earth's culture. His life flies before his eyes and music begins to play. The planet explodes. The overlords fly away, leaving the melody so that anyone who flies by can hear it. This is where the series ends. The series itself is not bad, but the director couldn't deliver the deep meaning that lies in the small format book of Arthur Clarke. And so, let's read the written books, because the human imagination repeatedly surpasses the most modern possibilities of filmmakers.